Glad to have you here in the house of the Lord tonight. Please be in prayer for my wife, Rachel. She's home with a very bad headache and she's just felt kind of rotten all day for one way or another. So uh, I just was kind of letting her rest this evening and I had my son there helping out with the girls and everything uh, so they could get some of that, uh, so she could have some help there in case. So do pray for her and pray for us. We'll be headed out this weekend to go to my in-laws, uh, going up there. Um, my sister, new sister-in-law and my brother-in-law are back from Brazil. So uh, they got home and we got all settled in. So we're going to go up there and spend, uh, spend the weekend up there with them. So we're anticipating a, a good time in the Lord this coming week. Uh, so just, but uh, be faithful here to the house of the Lord. Uh, make sure you come for Sunday school. Brother Aaron's been doing a wonderful job on a on the lesson there about knowing God in, in different in different facets of our lives through the Scriptures and and how the Spirit and through fasting and prayer and all these wonderful things. So please. Uh, be here for Sunday school, and uh, of course, uh, Pastor Ron will be here covering the main message on for the morning and evening service. All right, let's take our Bibles, if you would please. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't have, it's not going to be on the screen tonight. I just put that up there. So if you didn't bring your Bible, you should always bring your Bible. You never know when technology will fail you. You know, because I've been I've been in services before where the entire power went out and we still had to have service. So we ended up having a candlelight service. All the music was a cappella, and we had uh, man, I'm telling you, we had a time. We had a time. So if you got a Bible app on your phone, if you were naughty and didn't bring your Bible, that's okay. You know. <laughs> The Bible says here in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read the first 14 verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinating, predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wow, that's awesome. But we're going to spring right out here. Uh, from verse 3, about spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I mean, we've just read a whole bunch of things just in the first 14 verses of 
of all these wonderful things that are in store for us and how Christ himself will gather all those things which are in heaven and in earth, even in him. He's going to gather them all together. Uh, and the Bible does talk about how we're seated together in heavenly places. So it's good to look at heavenly places. Amen. And uh, But we're going we're gonna to bring a lesson tonight with God's help on spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Heavenly Father, bless now this time. Bless your word to our hearts. May it be a time that's profitable to each of us, Lord. Have your will and your way in this service, Lord. Meet the need of each heart and each life through your word tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, of course, we know that God's blessed us as his children in this world. And certainly, thanksgiving and in a heart of thanksgiving is a must for the child of God. It's just a must. He's just too good for us not to have thanksgiving on our heart uh, toward him for all that he is and all that he does. You know, we have all these things to enjoy in this life, and we really do live in a marvelous world. If you think about this, I think just think about it. Just remove the people for a minute. We live in a marvelous world. Now put the people back in it. And uh, yeah, it's less marvelous but what they make it. But no, it's, it's a good thing. All right? If we look around at the world around us, we've got no problem finding something to thank God for. The beauty of a sunrise or the beauty of a sunset. You know, uh, how everything. And, and I was reading this week, too, and uh, a, a little bit. And, and, and the Bible talks about the sun and the moon and the stars that all have their courses set. Amen. They have their courses set. We're riding a rock that's got its own course. In the whole picture of things. With everything turning and rotating and things in motion, everything has a, a course that's set before it so that it can go and do the thing that and perform the thing and walk the course that God has given it to walk. God gave everything he made a purpose, a plan, and a walk, and a course. He changed our course when we got saved. He gave us a road that doesn't go to hell. He gave us a road through this life that, yes, it's going to have ups and downs. Yeah, it's going to have problems and issues. Yeah, it's going to have heartache, heartbreak. Yes, it's going to have lots of wonderful stress. It's going to have it all. But it's also going to have some of the greatest times that you can think of. It's also going to have some of the most unbelievable wow factors. And, I mean, just look at last year alone, how many wow factors that we had thanks to a Wednesday night prayer service and praying and God's people praying. Stuff that's on scans disappear. When it looks like you're going to get cut, and they say, nope, we don't need to cut you now. It's gone. When it doesn't look like you're going to heal too well, and then God goes, whoop, hey, look who's back to hell. It doesn't seem, you know, you're weak and you get strong. And, you know, that's the thing, that's the beauty of the downtimes, is the downtime should cause expectation. You know, I preached not too long ago about expectations and how important that they are. But there's something that you can always expect in the down times, and that's an uptime. You can expect God to do something. And as long as we keep going in the course that God has set for us, we're going to get up out of that thing. And we're going to rise above it, and we're going to go on to greater heights. Because of it. 
And God has done this. And most of our earthly blessing depends on us, our faithfulness to the Lord and His work. And many of our earthly blessings are still undeserved. I mean, I can honestly say I don't deserve anything I've ever got from God in this life. I, do, I deserve nothing. I deserve nothing. I didn't even deserve to be saved. I didn't deserve for any of that. But God in His goodness says, I'm going to do it anyway. I love you in spite of you. I'll save you in spite of you. I'll help you in spite of you. I'll give to you in spite of you. All day, every day. That's what God gives us. We don't deserve any of it. We don't deserve wonderful spouses and, and beautiful children. We don't deserve good friendships. We don't deserve any of that. We don't even deserve to wake up in the morning. But God is good and allows us to do it. Man, there's so much we can be thankful for. Our greatest blessings are found in heavenly things through the Lord Jesus. Greatest things that God has done for us are still unseen to the human eye. They're only seen through the eye of faith. Those are some of the greatest things we've never seen. We, you, know what, you know what just gives me goosebumps every time I read it? Is when, when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to Simon and he says, I have held, I have seen, but he held salvation in his hands. I have seen thy salvation. Now let thy servant, I pray, depart in peace. He got to see what we didn't. He got to hold what we didn't. That's amazing. We look back on that through the eye of faith of that which we've never seen. Therefore, the blessings that are the greatest are those in which we've never seen but we will. You'll get to see. You're going to get to see. And that ought to be exciting. The highlands of faith, we find many of them enumerated, uh, or, or enumerated for us in, in Ephesians. We have the heavenly blessing of his eternal plan for us. Of course, we know that's all about grace. And you'll find that in verse 1 and 2 and 13. His grace, of course, like I just mentioned, is undeserved. We don't deserve grace. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. His grace is also unreserved. 1 Corinthians 15.10, the Bible says this, but by the grace of God... I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. His grace is also unlimited. Amen. I love that. We all st are stuck with limitations. No matter how good you have it, you still have limits to what you can do. The richest man on the planet still has limits to what he can do. But God's grace has no ceiling. It has no cap. It has no cutoff. It's unlimited. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, 
and knew the grace of God in truth. What a bunch of verses. Wow. Think about that. You hear the gospel, the truth of the gospel. It's come to you. It's in all the world. It brings forth fruit in you since the day you heard it. Since the very day you heard it, it's already starting to develop fruit in you. Woo! And that's done through the grace of God in truth which is the Word of God. Man, verse 13, that first part, we see how we saw things. We sought things in the second part. We were sealed in the last part of verse 13. We're sealed until the day of redemption, which means you're purchased by the blood of God, you're purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, but you are not yet redeemed. Because you hold the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what seals us unto the day of redemption when the physical possession of the purchased property takes place, which would be the catching away of the church. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. It's that catching away. Only God, think about this. This is awesome. I've, I've, I've thought about this many times, and I know I've mentioned it before, but it bears repeating just because it's awesome. When you think about the book of seals, the book that no man was worthy to open, no, no, you couldn't even look on the book. There wasn't anybody worthy to even look at this book of seals. Jesus Christ was the only one who could take that book out of the hand of the Father and open the seals. So why do we think anybody else could ever take the seal off of us that he put on us? Do you realize that Jesus is the one who stamped the seal to begin with? On the book, only he could open it. Therefore, because he has given us his Holy Spirit, and it preserves us until the day we are sealed, which means he's the only one that can open it. All the demons in hell can't get him out of you. The devil himself can't get him. No person, no family, no problem. Nothing could unseal you. Only God himself, the word, the son of the living God, can open that seal. And he does that through the catching away. Now, when we when we pass, if we go, we go by way of death, then absolutely he unseals us because it's he who will loose that silver cord. We come out of there. And that's and the Bible talks about the silver cord until the silver cord be loosed. That's what holds our soul in our body. He's the one that releases that when it's our time to go. That's why when it comes to the day of death, no man hath power over his own body to say, no, not yet. There's no IV drip that they can give you to hold that in. There's no, there's no wrapping you in, in shrink wrap to keep your soul in. There's no putting you in a plastic bag and holding it in. That still may put you in a bag, but you won't, you'll be gone. You won't care at that point. He's the one that releases the cord, which releases us, and we become unsealed at that point and escorted into the arms of God himself. Secondly, we see the heavenly blessing of his eternal peace for us in verse 2. Now, the world has no peace because their peace depends on themselves and their circumstances. Remember, Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. But I want you to have my peace. Therefore, let peace reign in your heart. If peace does not reign in your heart, it's because you have put somebody else on the throne. 
You put worry on there. You put stress on there. You put frustrations on there. You put whatever else it was, and it robs your peace, and peace is just wanting to get back to the place where Jesus put it. We get into trouble when we start moving things around that God has put in place. Which, thank, thanks be to God, we couldn't do anything with the Holy Spirit. Do you know how many people would move him out and become unsealed? Because it was more convenient for their lifestyle and their carnality. Colonel people don't like to be in a place like this. They don't like to hear the truth. They don't like to be challenged about why they shouldn't have those things in their lives. They want to go somewhere that's just, you're good just the way you are. No, you're not. And God is very clear on you're not. Very clear. They deceive. Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. The saint has perfect peace because his peace depends on Jesus, not the circumstances. Which is why we could say we're blessed even in the midst of all the terrible things that might happen to us or our family or friends. And that's John 14, 7 is the verse that I, that I read to you. And it ends with, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ephesians 2.14, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Thirdly, there's the heavenly blessing of our eternal position in Christ. Boy, I'm really glad I got a different position because I was not in a good position before. But I am now. Oh, you just say that because you're a preacher. No. Nope. Do you know something? I want to share a little truth bomb with you. I am in no better position with God as a preacher than I was before I ever went into the ministry. My position is the same in Christ. I am in good standing with God. Just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean I get elevated to some other kind of position. The position is here. Yes, I came from there and I'm up here now. But that doesn't make me closer to God. That doesn't make me in better standing. It doesn't make my prayer go through more than yours. It doesn't get his love more to me than you. He loves us all the same. We're all fellow laborers together. Hey, I find when John and, and other, other people in the Bible, they bowed down in front of the angel, and the angel said, hey, don't do that. You worship God. Now the angels are above us in power, stature, and they're right in the throne room of God. Don't you worship me. You worship God. And a true spirit of God and a true person that represents God will always deflect it to God. Do not bother worshiping me. Do not put me on a pedestal. You put him on a pedestal because he, that's, that pedestal ain't big enough. I'm too little to be on that thing. Ain't no way I need to be up there. I'm happy right where I'm at. I'm lucky to get in the door. I'm happy to get in the door. Even if I had no place and I just had to kick, kick it under the tree of life or something, I'd be just fine. I'm going to have a body that will never tire. You ever wonder why we, need a, why we need anything? Like what are we even going to use our rooms and our houses for? You know, <laughs> come on over to my house. Why? I don't need no house. I don't need no room. All I need is to be there with him. That's just extra goodness of God because that's what we're used to. Even though we're going to be changed, he brought some of that 
mentality of being here and having a place of ownership here, just like a place at the table. Just like setting the table and you have a place there. And I have made a place for you. And that is our place. And I'm fine with whatever he wants to give me. I don't need no mansion. I don't know what I'd do with it if I had it. I mean, all I could do is just praise the Lord. I wouldn't have to, you know, DTE ain't going to get me there. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to worry about any of that. We don't even need any of that. There's a place of our position, which is in heavenly places. 2 Peter 3.13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. The person of our position, of course, is Christ. No need to really uh, elaborate too much there, uh, but it, it's the truth. We wouldn't even have a standing in God without Christ Jesus. So, I mean, that pretty much goes almost without saying. And there's the pleasure of our position, is the good will of his pleasure, or the good pleasure of his will. And in Romans 9, 16, So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Philippians 2, 13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Not your good pleasure, but his good pleasure. Lots of people miss that. They want to just think, oh, yes, he's appointed me to walk in pleasure. Nope, not yours. There's a direction on that pleasure, and it does not point back to you. It points to him. He wills it that you do his good pleasure. Have you ever just stopped and wondered what pleases God? And then analyzed where you're at and am, is what I do pleasing him? That's something everybody ought to do. That helps us keep us on the up and up as well. Fourthly, there's the heavenly blessing of our eternal purity in Christ. There's the character of our peace. It's holy without blame before him. Of course, we know in Jude... Uh, it's only got one chapter, verse 24. We use this a lot, but now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Then there's the cause of our purity, which is in love. This is all the cause of it. Love is the cause of it, of it all. 2 Thessalonians 2.16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. 1 John 4.10, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That just means substitute. And lastly, there is the heavenly blessing of our eternal purpose. We find that in the, from verse 9 through uh, verse 14. Now, there's a purpose of gathering uh, in verse, uh, verse 10. It says, gather in, one all, uh, gather in one all things in Christ. And that's what we have to do here. We have to, that, that he's going to gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. That's what he's going to do. There's a purpose for it. 2 Thessalonians 2.1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by, listen at the wording here, and by our gathering together unto him. Now, we know that that's talking about the Lord gathering us up, but you know what we're doing tonight? We're gathering together unto him it's practice it's practice that's what a church attendance is all about gathering together unto the lord for the lord the whole cause is the, the lord it's not the music it's not it's not the preaching although that's important and the word is important 
And the truth is important. And we'd be lost without it. But why do it all? Why do any of this? Because we're gathering together unto the Lord. Because if we gather, we gather unto the Lord. If we sing, we sing unto the Lord. When we preach, we preach unto the Lord and to everyone else in the room. We let him preach to us. We let him speak to us through his word. That's the important thing. Too many people go to churches that just all they care about is how I feel with the music or how I feel about the teaching, how I feel about this or that. Wow, whoa, wait, wait, wait. You're going for the whole wrong reason. If you ain't going to see Jesus, you're, you've gone for the wrong reason. If you're not interested in hearing the truth, you've gone for the wrong reason. It's all just flesh and what I want, not what he wants. That's why churches like ours aren't popular and overwhelmed with people flooding our gates and flooding our little parking lot to get in here. But you know what we continue to do in spite of it all? We continue to gather ourselves together unto him. If there be five or 500, it should not matter. The reason why. You don't go just to see people. You don't go just because you like people. You don't go just because it's my social outlet. Or I really just enjoy the coffee together. Anybody could meet at a coffee shop down the street. There's plenty of them out there. 24-hour Duncan right around the corner. 24-hour Tim Hose down the court, down the street. Corner of North Line. Open 24 hours a day. You can have coffee anytime you want. But how are you how often are you really thinking about gathering together unto the Lord? That's what ought to be on our minds, folks. Honestly, there's this purpose of garnishing. We have an inheritance, it mentions in verse 11. 1 Peter 1, 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. You've got an inheritance reserved for you. Don't you love reservations? Aren't they fun? Don't you feel powerful when you have a reservation? They're holding it for me. That's right. They're waiting for me to show up. God has you a reservation. That's awesome. You think about that. I don't get to go to restaurants that have reservations. Only a matter of fact, I'm, I'm having trouble finding any that even do anymore. At least in Michigan. I know everybody else is probably, oh, you have to just, it's by appointment only. Then there's the purpose, lastly, and you can all breathe a sigh of relief. The purpose of glorifying in verses 12 through 14, his glory. It's the praise of his glory. It's God getting glory in the church. That's where it's supposed to be. Not necessarily God just getting uh, praise and glory somewhere else, although you should praise him somewhere else. But it is about God getting glory inside the church. As we gather together, as we praise Him together, as we worship the Lord together in spirit and in truth, all that just comes out to the praise of His glory. Listen, the, the praise is His and the glory is His. There's none to be had for us. God is a jealous God. He doesn't share His glory. And you know something? I don't want any of it. He can have all that. I don't need his, him to share that with me. I'm not even deserving of, it, of, what, of what he's given me already. But one day I will stand in the glory of the Son of God that will light everything up to the point that it will make the sun look like a nightlight. 
I like that. And you don't have to worry about getting baked at the same time. No more lobsters in heaven. That's going to be a great thing. Romans 11.36, last verse I'll share with you this evening. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. That's what it's all about right there. Everything is for him, through him, to him. It's all things. And he should have glory in all things. Through the church, through us, wherever we're at. That's important steps. These are spiritual blessings in heavenly places. It's fun to think about some of the things that the Bible at least alludes to that we'll have there. The Bible has given us an excellent amount of teasers in here. It should make anybody excited and ready to go to heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day.